Today, I'm going to talk to you about how the European Union's internal borders are evolving. Why? Because to our minds, borders serve mainly to protect and even more often to divide. But one rather innovative idea and practice coming from the EU is to ensure that borders between member states not only cease to divide but also cease being an obstacle. So today, I'm going to give you several concrete examples of what is being done to transform borders that divide into borders that bring together. This is a map of European Union. You can see the external borders and the internal borders. And since the Maastricht Treaty established a single market in 1992, followed by the Schengen Agreement, the free movement from one country to another of capital, services, goods, and in theory, even people, is ensured. And this is important, not just for the economy or employment, but also because 37% of EU inhabitants live just a few kilometers from a member state border, nearly 200 million people. And that is not a widely known fact. So 25 years ago, the EU developed a financial instrument, which is ultimately a political instrument, called Interreg. And until 2020, it will fund 107 programs involving thousands of projects. So let's have a look at how it works in concrete terms, in various locations throughout Europe, and in several different cases. First, Let's take a trip to the area between Spain and France to look at issues concerning human health. The border between the two countries roughly follows the ridgeline of the Pyrenees. Now we can see the plateau of Cerdagne or Cerdagna in Catalan. Upper Cerdagna is the name of the French part and Lower Cerdagna, the Spanish part. It is a remote, very beautiful region where people enjoy skiing and walking, the population can increase there from 30,000 to 150,000 in the tourist season. But in the event of an accident or health problems, people living on the French side used to drive over 100 kilometers to be treated in the city of Perpignan. Because of this lack of health care provision, the French Ministry of Health and its Catalan counterpart created in 2010 a European grouping of territorial cooperation. And via this new legal structure, they invested 31 million euros to build a transborder hospital, 60% of which was funded by the Interreg program. The hospital is located at Puiserda on the Spanish side, two kilometers from the Franco-Spanish border. It opened just recently in autumn 2014 and is accessible from both sides of the border. And in fact, it raises a certain number of questions, such as the civil liability of French employees regarding medical procedure carried out in Spain. Or for example, say a French woman gives birth on the Spanish side, the baby must be able to be recognized as having French nationality. Other example is in the event of a death, where should it be registered? So issues surrounding health, legal, and even policing norms must be settled by transborder cooperation in cases like these. Now, let's take a look at a different example linked to the weight of history, not to say to the weight of war. This is the United Kingdom with its Northern Ireland part, and now you can see the border with the Republic of Ireland. As the two states are members of the EU, crossing the border in theory is unrestricted. But the Northern Ireland conflict has, of course, left many scars. And it wasn't until May 2015 that Jerry Adams, the president of the Irish Republican Party Sinn Féin, agreed to meet a member of the British royal family during Prince Charles' visit to Galway. For a long time, because of the impact of the conflict, people were not crossing the border. Border crossings have only started to flow since the Good Friday Agreement signed between the two countries in 1998 and thanks to the EU peace program specific to Ireland and Northern Ireland. The idea is to favour reconciliation by intervening in education, health and citizen information. Now let's have a look at the border between Sweden and Finland, two member states of the EU. 
The border follows the River Torne. Two twin cities exist, Tornio in Finland and Aparanda in Sweden. So to fully grasp the story, we need to go back over history. In 1809, Finland was under Swedish domination before it passed under Russian administration at the end of the last Swedish-Russian war. Sweden lost the town of Tornio and then developed the town of Aparanda. In 1917, during the Russian Revolution, Finland declared its independence and Tornio became a Finnish town. And today, on account of their joint origins, the inhabitants of Tornio and Aparanda communicate equally in Finnish, Swedish and the regional dialect of Minkeli. These twin towns have signed numerous agreements for the sharing of public services, such as a joint swimming pool, water and other waste treatments, and emergency and firefighting services. A joint tourist office was even created in 1998. So among the most tangible results are the creation of a retail district straddling the border, and the two communes have decided to adopt a single name and logo, Tornio Aparanda, and vice versa, and Interreg funding help implement all these agreements. Bien, okay, but what measuring instruments do we use to evaluate the result of this sort of cooperation? Well, in fact, it is always a little vague, but in the same time we must keep going because the idea is always the same, healing, forging ties once again, and looking to the long term because often our first foreigners are quite simply our neighbors. I will take into account wider issues that require transnational cooperation to get neighboring states to cooperate on the problems they share. Let's have a look at the Baltic region to study the issues of pollution. You can see Russia present in this region with St. Petersburg at the very end of the Gulf of Finland and by the exclave of Kaliningrad. All the other neighboring states are now members of the EU. The neighboring population represents 17% of the EU population as a whole. In other words, 85 million people plus the non-member states. So the first macro-regional strategy in Europe was developed here, the EU-Baltic Sea region, with three objectives. Strengthen integration, help balance development, and establish an environmental policy, namely to fight illegal fishing in the Baltic, the spread of algae, and the emptying of cargo ballast water, which imports invasive species into the sea, such as the fish Neogobius, or a Chinese crab and predatory plankton. All these situations have affected ecosystems of the Baltic Sea Zone. So this strategy, co-financed by Interreg, aims by 2021 to eliminate phosphorus and nitrogen inputs in the sea and to create mandatory marine environment assessment. This involves stabilization of sturgeon stocks, training for farmers so they reduce the use of chemical inputs in the soils and the aerial surveillance of pollution from urban discharges into the sea or from the deballasting of ships. These few examples in various locations of EU are a good illustration of the variety of problems that need solving. So, to sum up, let's take an overview. Here is once again a political map of the 28 member states of the Union. Now take a look at this other map coming from the EU, more precisely from the DG Regio, Directorate General for Regional Policy. It shows us the Transborder Cooperation Programme for the period 2014-2020, including in Amazonia Caribbean, Madeira, Azores, Canary Islands and the Indian Ocean. And now this is a map of transnational cooperation programs. It shows the extent and diversity of all these programs. This type of cooperation and the investment induced represent over 10 billion euros for some 107 programs, totally nearly 10,000 projects for the period 2014-2020. That might seem expensive, but what we never calculate is that it would cost even more not to cooperate, 
The idea is to stimulate economic, social and ecological interactions by reinforcing flows of goods, people, equipment, energy, information and investment, in particular for innovation. So as you can see with these examples, it's a matter of making life easier for people living near borders. Firstly, because most borders are the result of former military operations. In some cases, cooperation still serves to repair the wounds of history. Secondly, the interact programs seek to overcome these borders in order to find joint solutions to joint problems. Because after all, the policy is inspired by territorial practicalities and not by the constraints of sovereignties or by the weight of national histories. Most of the problems we face today can no longer be managed on a national scale alone. Terrorism, epidemics, pollution, global warming, migratory flow, financial flow, digital flow, none of these movements stop at borders. As you will have noticed, I've just painted a very favorable picture of the way this has worked for 25 years. But of course it's not perfect. Although some states cooperate very well, in many instances national institutions block or hinder transborder and transnational cooperation. Finally, the EU has difficulties recounting these activities and making them accessible and understandable for the general public which is a pity, because the work they put in is very interesting. It should temper the constant criticism that are leveled at Brussels by citizens, politicians and sometimes even states. And all this work acts against inward-looking attitude, misrepresentation, lack of comprehension of others and the cheap populism that is on the rise.